about three years ago to consider getting involved in an initiative called Formula E. And maybe you'd just put up the next slide, please, gents, or the slide. And this was, um, this basically, for those that you don't know, is Formula One, which you all know, or most of you know, but it's an electric version of that. And it's been running internationally for nine seasons now, for nine years. The cars are quicker than Formula One cars. It's incredibly exciting. And the series is entirely a net zero. So zero CO2 output, net zero, in a sustainable way. So the way they conduct themselves and the way we have to, thank you, which one do I, uh, I guess the thing that says next, that's the, okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but now I'm technical. So we decided the Mother City was the venue to put this beautiful event on. But my, in everything that I've tried to do over the last 25 years, I've always sought to put purpose at the center of what we do. So what do I mean by that? How do we actually put into this beautiful world of ours rather than take from it simplistically? And there's many ways of doing that, and I'll show you how we did it. So firstly, a little more about Formula E. There are 17 races globally. There are 10 world cities featured, and Cape Town this year was the first year. Four continents, and the Generation 3 car is the world's most efficient race car in the world. And Formula E remains committed to its net zero carbon efforts in line with the highest standards available, as audited under all the necessary um, uh, ISO uh, certifications, etc., that some of you will be familiar with. This is the track. We built it on city roads city roads that needed to be relayed in certain instances. And the track length around the stadium is 2.94 kilometers. And the average speed that the cars traveled at was 132 kilometers an hour. Now bear in mind, they're doing a lot of corners, turning, etc., to give you an idea of the speed. And the fastest lap ever recorded in a formula was 154.987 kilometers an hour. So, that was a pole lap, and that gives you an idea of the kind of speed the cars are traveling at. Having staged the race, we've done an economic impact assessment, or we didn't do it, Nielsen's and Repucom, two very re reputable uh, agencies, produced it. And the monetary impact was 1.04 billion rand in our very first year. And we had lots of media value. We had 18,000 people that came to the race. And when we do it for the second time, we aim to have 40,000 people. Nobody believed that we would sell out. I assured everybody we would. And the Thursday before the race, we did sell out. Now, that's the race. Um, what did it do for South Africa in terms of tourism? So the cumulative audience for this rounds one to nine, 29.61 million people got to watch the cars in Cape Town and saw the beautiful city. South Africa was featured, and that would have been in a program of an hour at a time. And the live audience globally was 20.54 million. Now that's a lot of eyeballs out there that are focusing on what we're doing. Before we did it, season eight represents what happens beforehand. In our country, only 16% of the population knew about Formula E. Having staged the event, it's up to 23%, a 46% increase, as you would expect. But, but the fan size increased from 1.5 million to almost 2 million. But this is the biggie. The TV audience, the total television audience, went from 5 million to 19 million, a 390% change, and the live audience went from 2 million to 16 million people. Sure. So the live audience was 16 million people strong. That's a pretty cool first year output, I would say to you. And here's the really cool news, we were voted as the number one race on the global calendar. Wow. Now we're not up against much, uh, we're up against incredible competition when you consider Monaco, London, Berlin, Rome, who've been doing this in the case of Monaco for 87 years and who are magnificent and beautiful, but South Africa and Cape Town in this instance meant something to that audience and meant something to the participants. They absolutely loved it. So the race was an unmitigated success, but here, that's the celebration. 
Here's the purpose piece that I speak of. This is the real reason that I pushed to do this and why we did it. It's a legacy. We staged Africa's Green Economy Summit before the race. What is that? That is a summit that connects global capital, money, with African green economy opportunity. We had 300, they say 350 plus, to be exact, 381 delegates in our first year. We had 77 speakers, it says 80 plus, we had 77. And we had 60 investors present. We had 99 matchmaking sessions. That means m connecting those financiers with project opportunities. And in our very first day, it was over two days, we were able to effect that connection that's resulted in money being invested. An old school friend who happens to have just finished his term as the head of climate change for the World Bank, John Room, Michael, you will remember, John is now the head of sustainable infrastructure for South Asia. So that takes in Pakistan, he's been dealing with the floods in Pakistan, $30 billion to fix the problem. India, Bangladesh, etc. John helped to shape the program, he came out and he got a gentleman who heads up the Solar Alliance, the World Solar Alliance, there's 136 countries, who in the last year oversaw the investment of $200 billion. Okay, that's four trillion rands worth of investment, to put it in rands. He came on, he recorded, he's in Delhi, he couldn't be with us, and he said, of our 200 billion, billion investment in solar, only 5% has found its way to, South, to Africa, 5%, which is tiny, particularly when you consider the resources we have in the form of sun. Mm. But he said the reason for that is the African projects are generally not seen as bankable projects. Mm -hmm. So the, the financial institutions that lend against these projects are not prepared to finance it. And he said it's only because they don't understand the fact that these are really valid projects. Some of them are smaller scale. And he said by the end of this year, we as the Solo Alliance will be the intermediary between the funders and the projects. And we will effectively be the credit guarantee for these projects. So you can look forward to a lot of money flowing into Africa for solo investment. So that was an output from our Africa's Green Economy Summit. I truly believe that this platform can become the equivalent of the mining in Daba. Many of you will know about the mining in Daba, 15,000 people at its peak, maybe down to 10 or 12 now, it's huge. This is going to be that for the green economy. Because of all the elements, so let, what else did we create? We launched Go Green Africa. And we aim to be a leader for African green economies by being an organization that brings companies together, the big polluters, for example. So Eskom's on board. Waiting on Fleetwood Schrobler as the CEO of, of, of Sassel, we've been talking for over a year, hoping to have Sassel, our two very biggest polluters in, the, in, in Africa. Now, they're on board, what are they doing? Well, actually, there's a lot of good stuff that people don't know about that we showcased at our electric festival for Eskom, for example. Eskom have, Eskom have invented and built something called a microgrid at a, a speed of between 200 and 1,000 times the pace that it takes right now using a geometric progression of modeling. Jonathan's on board. The first thing we've got him going is looking at green hydrogen. Everybody says, oh, green hydrogen. We're going to be the world's greatest supply of green hydrogen. What nobody tells you is that in the catalytic process to separate the H and the O, the hydrogen and the oxygen, you require a rare earth metal called iridium. Iridium is in South Africa. We're one of the biggest holders one of our big, biggest asset holders of Iridium. But the, the projects being spoken about in the Northern Cape and Namibia alone is about 100 times what our Iridium resource is. So the question is, how are you going to separate these molecules if you're not using Iridium? And we don't want to mine if we can avoid it because it affects the environment and there's water contamination. There's all the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. So today, Jonathan 
whose business is called Materials Nexus, is doing a modeling, which is a small-scale model, to take uh, the process, it, and it's going to take 18 months. It would normally take 20 years. It's AI-driven. But he's looking at how to get electrons, which is a general category, to be the, the thing that is used within the catalyst rather than iridium. Now, what does that mean? This came about because Sassel Krobler, Sassel in Sasselberg, have eight Fischer-Tropf reactors. They're the things that get fired with gas at the moment, which is gray hydrogen, and which produce fuel. And they're amazing at what they do. But if he could have green hydrogen, it takes his business as the second largest polluter to a green business, and it becomes worth 10 times what it is today. Anyway, Blackie, am I overtaking my time? Do I need to move on? <laughs> yes, okay, apologies. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to move on now. Okay, so that's Go Green Africa. We have others, the eFest Electric, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is we have an entire ecosystem which supports what we're doing and is our real reason for being. We have these platforms with Tourism South Africa, South African Tourism, the IP and designation, the branding, the experiential side, the hospitality, the ticketing, the exclusive experiences, et cetera. We work with SA Tourism on this, which the race itself provides us an opportunity to do. And in conclusion, we're just you know, celebrating a 12-month-a-year focus on sustainability and the green economy and believe that what we have is a perfect showcase of what can be achieved for South Africa with respect to global coverage, local impact, whilst providing a backdrop for significant purpose-led work in our country and sustainability sits at the very center. So on that note, I thank you for your time. Apologies, Black, if I was more than 10 minutes. I think I was 14, 13. And it's over to you, Elmer. Thank, thank you so you much, much, Ian. Black, you must know we waited 45 minutes to start. So anyway, uh, thank true. you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And it's actually so encouraging to see these types of initiatives and to hear what's actually happening in South Africa um, and to have that type of knowledge. So before we delve into the questions, can I just ask the panel to just very shortly introduce yourself and then we will continue. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Sabti Pugola. I'm from an organization called Ranzo Network and I serve um, as the chair of the Growth and Transformation Committee of the TPCSA board. Good afternoon. Mr. Blackie Kamala said this morning, why does tourism matter? And I think for each and every one of us here, tourism matters for you personally. But representative here in this room, someone, one of the pieces of the sector is not here. And this is the informal sector that forms part of the tourism economy. And I'm here to give today a voice for the informal sector and say some context within the informal sector, which plays such a big part. My name is Alicia Fari. I'm a professor at the Gordon Institute of Business Science, and my research and passion is the informal economy within the tourism sector. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> I'm Nyari Samushwanga. I'm the CEO of We Think Code, and the focus of our work is training young Africans, especially from underserved communities, to become software developers. And we see that as an underlying and important workforce in terms of growing the South African economy across sectors. So I'm excited to be here and lend a voice to what tech and digitization can do to ignite sustainable growth. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Tami Matsero. I am the CEO of the Northwest Parks and Tourism Board. We are the host, we are hosting you at North Northwest, and we say welcome to our beautiful, warm Northwest province. Thank you. Thank you so much, panel. Let's start with a very important one. Um, we know how important our environmental resources are for tourism, but it is also constantly under pressure. Mm. So how can we ensure that we halt or reverse biodiversity loss and also the climate change, that climate change crisis is prioritized. Klami, let's give it first to you. Okay. Thanks, Elmarie. Uh, maybe let me first start by thanking the organizers of this conference for highlighting for once 
the, the climate change tourism nexus. You know, research tells us that um, tourism stakeholders are saying climate change, even though we hear about it in the news or in media platforms, we, we rarely hear about climate change in any of our conferences, workshops, or wherever we go. So it is such a significant and considerable milestone and remarkable. We appreciate that effort. But coming back to your questions there about uh, climate change and biodiversity loss, you know, we, 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 we as a government of South Africa, and I would like to comment my government, have done quite considerable, considerable amount of work with regard to looking into preserving our species preserving our ecosystems that are being degraded by not only climate change, by the way, but all other different kind of pressures like yeah, the changing land use patterns, like rapid urbanization, like um, agricultural activities, and all other anthropogenic uh, activities that erode our species. So the government has done a, quite a number of Instrument, uh, uh, produce a number of instruments and tools that try to respond to biodiversity loss. And one of them is a um, biodiversity sector plan. I know that in my, prog my, prog my province, we are in the second generation of the biodiversity sector plan. And in that plan, it, it, it identifies corridors of um, high value conservation species that need to be uh, uh, secured and protected, but it also look into wildlife refugee areas that need also to be preserved. So that, that is one of the most significant tools that is used by government in order to protect our species. But also there are other uh, programs like your park expansion prog program, where we say that all your protected areas, like for instance in Northwest, our protected areas are about 2.5 2.2, I mean, a percent of the total land mass of the province, which is quite insignificant. And so the program about park expansion is about increasing the sizes of our protected areas so that we've got more land space for our biodiversity. But also we've got a biodiversity stewardship program. That program, it says communities around the parks and also landowners that are around the parks. Let's come together with the management of parks management authority and let's come into incorporation, land incorporation agreement and make sure that the land that you own as a private person of a, or a community, it is used for conservation purposes and earmarked for that. But one of the key issues that I think it is underestimated in the country is education and awareness. Like I said, um, I was looking into studies and research that have been done. They were saying that um, climate change, it's seen as a, you know, something that is preserved for those who are educated scientists and rich industries, big industries. But somebody, for instance, who owns a game drive a vehicle in a small park does not relate to climate change at his or her level. So education and awareness is also one of the important uh, instruments that we can use. And lastly, enfo enforcement and compliance that con can also help. We know that we are busy working on a climate change bill. Uh, we've got climate change adaptation uh, programs that needs to be enforced at some stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. So there are plans in, in action. Yes. Because at the end of the day, the action is going to make a difference in, in terms of this. If we move to the, to the economic sphere of sustainability, we all know that unemployment is a major problem in South Africa. So what do you think, what are the solutions to our high unemployment rates in, in South Africa? Maybe Alicia first to you, and then Septi. Thank you very much, Amri. Yes, I mean, if you think about our official employment rate is currently at 32.6%, which is extremely high. Um, and I want to actually cap into the study that we have done when we did the research with regards to in the, the informal sector and the challenges they actually experience. Because if you look at the challenges they have experienced, you can actually look at possible recommendations that you can make. And one of the key things that came out is actually access to markets. Mm -hmm. We need to provide access to markets. And I want to make a use of an example. Uh, I interviewed a lady in, in Rosebank 
and she said she actually made a product uh, which is really unique. It is wired, but it's actually covered in very colorful material. Um, sometimes she uses shui shui material, and it's really unique. And she's actually trying to get this out to hotel groups. She wants to sell this to hotel groups. She's emailed, she phoned, but she cannot get into the market. So actually, you need a market maker. Yes, there's incubator programs. Angola has um, incubator programs. University of Pretoria has the Momolati Business Hub incubator programs. There's incubator programs. That's fantastic. But you need to market make it to bridge that gap. And I think that is one of the biggest things that we need to have a look at is how can we provide access to markets, not necessarily opportunities, because a lot of people have business ideas, but how do you capitalize in access to markets? And another thing that I really want to touch on in terms of employment is we need to really think about how do we revitalize and rebrand the tourism industry. Because recent events, such as in Cape Town with the taxi violence, gives this, the South African environment a blow, and especially with regard to the informal sector, that has halved. The informal traders has halved since COVID, right? They cannot take another blow, such as taxi violence and Cape Town being blocked off for a day to a week. Durban, beachfront that we have been visiting, Durban North to Durban South, the informal traders, which is the South African traders, the Zulu Gogos that's sitting there doing beadwork, they do not have customers because they're waiting for the buses to come but they do not. Why? Because there's an open exchange of drugs happening on the beachfront. There's beggars harassing the tourists. The infrastructure is dilapidated. So the tourists, but they sit there with desperation in their eyes when we talk to them and say they're waiting for the buses to come, but they do not come anymore. So we need to think about how do we rebrand and revitalize the sector, because that's how we can create employment opportunities, and that's how we keep the people that are actually currently in the sector alive. Thank you, Alicia. Safety ideas from your side? Yeah, thank you. I, I think there's a couple of things that we need to look at here. First of all, I think we need to start with what we have and maybe look at what gaps we need to plug. Um, I, when I say what we have in terms of you know, uh, jobs and job creation. And here I want to talk about the kind of education that we give our young people. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we need to give our young people, we need to educate our young people in skills that are in demand. In the, in, the, in the economy, in the tourism economy. And for us to be able to do that, we need a very close working relationship and collaboration between industry and our educational institutions. I think one gets the sense sometimes that the product that our academic institutions are producing, are producing is mismatched with the skills that exist. Now, I'm not saying that there's a whole lot of jobs available out there because that is not the reality. The reality is that this economy has been in job destruction mode mm. for a long time. So, you know, I mean, that's not lost to me. So not, there's not a lot of jobs available out there. But I think that, you know, even for the jobs um, that are available, sometimes there's a, there's a skills mismatch. Uh, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we need to do is to intensify that collaboration between the, you know, the educational sector and the private sector, you know, to clearly diagnose, you know, what the skills, demands, and gaps are, and make sure that we respond to those. Uh, we respond to those. So that'll be that'll be the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that, again, you know, it goes back to our relationship with our education system. I think we need to incorporate a lot more of entrepreneurship education uh, among our young people and really get the message out there to our young people that when you leave your university or college, there isn't a stack of jobs mm. waiting for you out there. And so the mindset that we need to get to our young people is, let's try the route of entrepreneurship. And I'll hasten to say, I am not suggesting that that's going to be a solution for all our problems. So I'm talking about a mix of solutions um, that we need to pursue. I think that, again, um, that element is still 
missing or lacking in, in our education. We need to um, incorporate a lot more entrepreneurial education. We need to do a lot more of encouraging young people to consider um, you know, uh, uh, opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities in tourism. And they don't need to see, uh, because part of the challenge that we have is that you know, those who pursue entrepreneurial opportunities have a very narrow view of what tourism is. Mm -hmm. And so they all go into doing exactly the same thing. And so you have this stampede where you have all these businesses that are not viable. So we need to also um, you know, just help our young people you know, broaden their perspective <coughs> of what you know, the entire tourism value chain is, where the opportunities are there. And the last point I want to make to this question is that, please, you know, um, I know we're going to talk about uh, yeah, transformation. This concept of shared value mm. it is a very important one. Mm. And what, by what, we, what we mean by that is that you know, we want to appeal to the established players you know, to um, open up a little bit you know, to the smaller players, mm. right? who typically employ our young people who are coming out of university without experience, so that you know, they have a slice of the action. You know, our economy is too concentrated. And, and tourism, I know that in tourism, the majority of players are SMEs, but their slice of the business is not, in my estimation, where it should be. So I think we need to have this uh, conversation that the big players and the, you know, need to just you know, adopt the concept of shared value and open up so that you know, they can work with the smaller players who in turn help us to absorb young people um, and spread the benefits out to communities outside of the urban centers. I think those are very good suggestions and, and coming from the higher education sector, we will always welcome discussion with the industry and how to improve products and, mm -hmm. and programs and so forth. One of the issues that we will also be talking about is technology and the effect of technology on sustainable tourism, which I think is significant. But what is your ideas around that, um, the effect of technology on sustainability? Nyari? Well, I think I'm, I'm excited. I'm about to bounce out of my chair because um, when you start to speak of the issue of relevant skills to market and technology becomes one of the large ones. Mm. And when we speak of growth and sustainability, the customer must come physically to where I am, see my product mm. and procure it. Mm. And yet in reality, what we need is a scenario where regardless of where I am, that product is accessible to me. Mm. But more than that, Imagine if that same Gogo's grandson actually knew how to engage e-commerce because he was equipped with a relevant technical skill. Suddenly, the concern of this Gogo is an emotional relevance to a grandson with a viable skill. And I think that's what we're missing in the conversation around transformation, inclusion, mm -hmm. and consequently sustainability, is that technology is actually a catalyst. No one wakes up needing a banking app. No one, you wake up needing to move your money, needing to see where it is, needing to know that it's safe. Now, when you wake up with that need and an awareness of what technology can do for you, then it's catalytic. You create a banking app. Suddenly, with the banking app, a vendor that relied on someone walking by with the cash to buy their wares can tap on a Yoko device, and we've created a market. So, the focus of the work that we do at We Think Code is around how do we get young Africans, primarily young Africans that don't access tech education, equipped with the know-how mm -hmm. to build software that can make South Africa relevant globally. And when you're talking about that within the context of tourism, you can look at it both from people visiting, you can look at it in the context of sharing our crafts, you can look at it in the context of spreading the story of who South Africa is, like we saw um, you know, with a sustainable race course. So for me, I see technology as this cross-cutting reality, where if South Africa can lift itself to a place where we are net exporters of technology rather than consumers, every industry, and especially tourism, would benefit. And so the question is, what is our sustainable, systematic plan to make sure that young South Africans are creators of software and not just consumers of TikTok? Mm -hmm. And I really think that's the inflection point. Mm. Thank you so much. Excellent. I think there's a few takeaways, definitely, from, from that. 
I think one of the cornerstones of sustainability is definitely communities. Mm. And we've seen it there yet in terms of involving communities um, as part of this whole tourism process. Any ideas from the panelists in how we can involve the community with greater success moving forward? Maybe Alicia, first to you. I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking about the fact that if, if one asks the questions, do we think that the communities are actually meaningful involved? I think if we need to be very honest, I think the answer is no. Because if you think about Durban, right? Durban, the communities in Durban is South African, right? It's, it's Zulu, predominantly Zulu women mm. in the informal sector. Moving to Cape Town, and moving to Johannesburg, the playing field changes. Majority Zimbabwean, Malawian, DRC, West Africa. The number of informal traders in Johannesburg and Cape Town with regards to South Africans are minimum. Right, now we have a situation in Durban where as a result of the situation and the crime, tourists are not coming anymore. So you do not see a new generation, the average age of a trader in Durban is 52. In Johannesburg and Cape Town, it's 41. You do not see a new generation of community involvement entering Durban because tourists are not coming anymore. But now you're losing that South African vibe in Durban. In Cape Town and in Durban, you see foreigners. So how do we balance that? So to Bring an honest truth, I don't, they are not involved. Mm. And we need to think about how do we get communities involved. Mm. Mm. Um, it's, so I, 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 I agree with that sentiment. For the record, I'm a, I'm a daughter of a Malawian mother and a Zimbabwean father. I love Malawian people. It's one of the <laughs> most friendliest <laughs> people in my opinion. I'm just hoping the stage is still a safe place for me. <laughs> it is. You are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but I think... What I want to express about communities, essentially, and I, I, I share the context of my heritage as a person who's lived in Tanzania and now in South Africa, is that there's an inherent hospitality that is African. Yes. So when you think of uh, tourism, the word hospitality comes to mind. And with the word hospitality comes the construct of community. Yes. But when you speak of tourism, there's an element of commercialization of community. And so the question of then accessing hospitality as a commercial tool is really, sometimes I think the problems we face, the gaps between where we are and where we want to be are not that far. Because you're not introducing a construct of hospitality and welcoming to communities that are otherwise hostile. And trying to say to them, be nice to other people, because if you play with other kids, then they'll come hang out with you and you could make some money. This is actually an inherently African construct, Ubuntu, um, Hunu, Ukama is what we call it in Shona. And so essentially, the question of how do you make communities aware that the very nature of who they are is something that could be commercialized is a small education for a big shift. And I think when you start to perceive it that way, uh, to the point that Septi was making earlier, which is if you can share that pie as an established industry with the knowledge of commercialization, and then respect and celebrate a community with an inherent nature of hospitality, then just like that, you ignite something magical. And so I think my sense of how to start to bring communities in, I was watching a video a few weeks ago of what's happened in Margate, where they had a problem with litter on the beaches, service delivery was down, property values were going down. Essentially, no one was winning from the prevalent calamity, right? And so what happened is local businesses got together with homeowners who were concerned about their property values and safety, businesses that needed tourism, and the very people that might have been vandals at the beach because you know, they didn't have economic opportunity. And together they said, every single one of us is going to be better off if this community is clean, if this community is safe, mm. and if what this community offers is attractive to others. Because that's the construct you spoke of, safety of shared value. Mm. And so I think that's, that's where the conversations need to start. You're not going to build a church through division. Mm. You build it by starting from the place of commonality. And the place of commonality in Africa 
as a truly Pan-African individual, both in my blood and in my life experience, is to celebrate the hospitality that we have and then speak to how that hospitality translates. Mm -hmm. And to go back, because I'm tech through and through, put those stories online and help people understand what these communities are, what the richness of that heritage is, mm -hmm. and then attract the people in. I, I don't think we're that far. It's who we are in our blood. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Safety? Well, yeah, no, I think for me, you know, I, I'll go back to the point that was made right at the beginning, and that's the point about market access. Um, if you look at economic development, especially, you know, uh, trade development, export development, um, how it typically works is that, you know, the big players who've got access to markets um, internationally are used by the smaller players to export through them, mm -hmm. right? And I think that you know, if we can adopt that model in tourism, where we say the big players which have the reach to um, domestic and international markets can work with the smaller players who are connected to the communities to make sure that the benefits come into those communities. So market access becomes um, one aspect of um, a response to that question. And how we do it, and the way I advocate, is that we use the model that's used in trade development in other sectors where you, know, you don't have these big entities that are vertically integrated all the way and elbow out the small players which are rooted in those communities. And by working with them, you could actually be bringing the benefits to those communities. Because let's face it, and this is not a generalization, it's not an accusation, but there's still an issue about you know, big players you know, extending the benefits to communities. And I think that SMEs are much better placed because they're rooted in those communities to you know, spread those, uh, you know, um, those uh, benefits uh, to communities. So you know, um, you know, that linkage between big and small becomes crucial. Um, that buy local that I think another group is going to talk about, mm -hmm. where the big players are encouraged to package uh, the products um, that are in communities, that involve communities, um, you know, would be another way to, to look at that. And I'm, and I'm happy that TPCSA has started to drive that campaign. I think it's a campaign that um, we absolutely need to intensify. And lastly, I think the point I'd like to make is that even communities themselves need to be helped, and I think the point has been touched on, uh, need to be helped to appreciate the assets that are in their immediate environment and how they can use those assets um, you know, to build tourism um, products, right? You know, what is called you know, asset-based approach to economic development. Mm -hmm. Because I find that, you know, I work a lot in communities. Um, we're doing a project in the Utugala district that sometimes communities don't really readily appreciate. They approach their situation from a deficit perspective mm -hmm. um, and don't appreciate the assets um, that, you know, are, are in their communities. And through a developmental process, uh, and, and this is a developmental intervention, through a developmental process, you help the communities to appreciate, identify and appreciate the community, I mean, the assets that they have, and then build you know, economic value um, around, around those assets. There's a lot of assets around the country rooted in communities that are not being used, that can quite easily be used for you know, tourism development, mm. and they are not being used currently. So I think it's a combination of things that we need to do from a developmental point of view, and so on and so on. Okay. Tell me, and maybe to add uh, to what everybody has said, I'll go again and say, you know, the government has attempted, has played its part, have developed a number of instruments and tools to ensure that community access the economic opportunities that are there, that are prevailing because of the land that is owned by their forefathers. Mm -hmm. And one such instrument is the Land Restitution Act. And we know that, and I think my peers that are in in protected area management space like myself, whether in Limpopo, whether in Bumalang, we face the same problem of the land that has been restituted within our parks. And when I joined the park about two years ago, when I met the communities, they were saying, you know, you government officials, you're seeing us as nuisance. And the industry is seeing us as an irritant. So to both sides, we don't know where to run to. But we are saying that we have the land, the land that you are beneficiating from. It is our land, number one. Number two, we, not, we should not be painted with one brush. 
that because you met community A and is less educated, then everybody else, as long as it's a community member, it means they are uneducated, they know nothing. They say, we want to co-generate knowledge with you mm -hmm. because there's a, a lot of any, a, a, a knowledge that we, we have within ourselves, not only maybe business um, ideas that we have, but also the indigenous knowledge management system, especially in the area of conservation and biodiversity. There's a lot that can be done, and we can commodify that knowledge so that we all benefit from it. Lastly, we are able to be able to help you to protect and preserve your, and your, your, your businesses and also protect the ecosystem together if you allow us to be part of you in this inclusive growth. And I met one lady about three days ago from the communities in Daung, a, a World Heritage Site, the Daung Skull Site. She was saying to me, a CEO, you know, uh, you are calling us that we are intangible uh, heritage resources. It's okay, we will embrace that concept. But we are more than coming to do rituals in your spaces and leaving candles after performing a ritual or making noise and so on and so on for you. But we are saying that there are certain amount of opportunities, like for instance, healing tourism, that's what she was telling to me, that Taungskal is a perfect, uh, they were talking about a, to, a certain area called Tumeng. Tumeng is a perfect healing portal that we can use to heal everybody in the tourism start, a, a space, not only in South Africa and not only black people for that matter. We've got a lot of uh, um, uh, customers that come from overseas that we can use and make this a viable uh, 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 business for everybody to enjoy. Just give us a, an opportunity to be part. Mm -hmm. So yes, communities out there are questing and hungering to be part of this economic uh, uh, growth uh, in our spaces. Thank you so much. We don't have that much time left, unfortunately. I think we can still go on for another hour. But can I just ask my panel if you can suggest just one thing that you want to change in the next year in terms of sustainable tourism? Just in a few words, what would that be? Ian, can I start with you? <laughs> Market access. Market access. Change in behavior. Changing behavior? And attitudes, yes. Yes? I'd say the high school curriculum needs to include software development as a core skill. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear where your heart is. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Alicia? I will say an enabling environment. Right. Safety? I would have nothing to change in one year, but this is the one thing I desperately want to change. Um, there's a lot of assets, government-owned assets, mm that are lying dilapidated, dilapidated across this country. <laughs> if we want to talk transformation and inclusion, mm. we need to find mechanisms to get those assets into the hands of communities and SMEs. And yeah. develop that sustainable. And that is yeah. absolutely sustainable. Yeah. Why should we let those assets that have been paid for with taxpayers' money go to waste? Right. Mm. Thank you so much. Colleagues, that's all that we have time for this afternoon. May I just thank a panel, the panel for very, I think, excellent solutions and answers. May we be able to implement a few of these in the, in the coming years? So thank you for so much for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, colleagues. Thank you, Elmar. Thank you. Thank you.